My name is Ellen Donald. I'm a member of the uh, Board of Directors, and I want to introduce today's session, the when, how, and why of the, the 2024 NPTE redesign. We have Laura Mueller, who is the Managing Director of Assessment, and we have Colleen Letvin, who is the NPTE Content Manager. And without further ado, I just want to give you some uh, structure. They're going to give their presentation, and then you are welcome to put questions in the chat. Um, we aren't able to answer you directly on the chat, but I will read the questions and then they will answer them at the end. So please, uh, if you have any questions, put it in that chat and we'll see how this all goes. So without further ado, take it away. Thank you for the warm introduction, uh, Ellen. Uh, we appreciate everyone's attendance here at uh, this webinar. We hope it's informative. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, just to... Uh, just to start this off, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen this before, I, I use this uh, regularly. This is really a de depiction of our five-year development cycle. Changes to the NPTE um, ought to occur regularly. regularly. They ought to be planned. Uh, we start that process with a practice analysis. Colleen will talk a lot about the content of that analysis, um, but that's where we reach out uh, to folks uh, all over the country and we try to get a better understanding of what they're doing and what uh, the uh, entry-level folks need to know and be able to do to, to perform successfully. From that, we derive the content outlines. We begin writing items. Uh, we go through a process called standard setting where we decide, well, on a given test form, uh, how many questions do you need to get correct in order to pass? Um, and then once all that work is complete, we we um, we begin testing. And so we're we're through uh, everything here, but that uh, that last little bubble there, testing. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit more about the practice analysis. This really sets the stage for everything that we do. Um, we do a yearly data collection, so that allows us to look at things like um, trends a little bit more reliably. Um, it allows us to reach out to more people. So what we do is we, we take pretty much everybody in our database and we cut them into five cohorts. So once you've been out there a while, um, we will reach out to you um, uh, once every five years. And um, uh, if you don't get our emails for the practice analysis, uh, reach out to us and update your contact information with us. Uh, we really do wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity uh, and a, and a um, a voice in this process and can tell us what they think is important to know and be able to do for those entry-level PTs and PTAs. Um, we also have a work activity survey and that goes out to everyone who passes the NPTE two years after they, they pass the NPTE. Um, so that one's a, a little bit uh, different than the five-year cohort cycle. That one goes out to everybody, um, but it's a smaller group. And, um, and then the knowledge and skill requirements survey, um, that's the one that, that comes every five years. And so these are slightly different. One is kind of what are you doing? And we send those to people who are right around entry level. And the other one is what do people have to know in order to do those things that, that they might be doing? Um, and that's the knowledge and skill requirements survey. Um, we look at, at both of those surveys together and we try to find the, the intersection between work activities that are important and corresponding knowledge and skill requirements that are also important. And that's what goes on the MPTE. Those uh, surveys are maintained yearly by the exam development committee chairs. They review it. Um, if we see anything that um, is unexpected or um, uh, a number that seems out of line and it's not really following a trend, um, it might be due to an edit or um, uh, something, a uh, terminology changing in the field. And so the exam chairs have an opportunity to update that on a yearly basis. And that's another advantage of collecting data yearly is that if we make a mistake, it only affects us for one year and then we can correct that mistake and have four other years of data uh, to back up any decisions that we're gonna make. So um, that's been a huge advantage to us. Um, at the end of that five-year process, we bring in a task force at the PT level and PTA level of uh, ta task uh, folks that are representative of the uh, profession uh, uh, at large. So they have different uh, work settings, different areas of expertise, uh, different regions of the country. So we try to be uh, inclusive and representative on those. And uh, they go through the data. Uh, it's kind of a guided process. We have a contractor that comes in, a group called Humro. They come in and they help us go through the data and say, well, if we set a, a cut point here, here's what would be in, here's what would be out. 
There are things that are always near the, the cut point that might be trending up or trending down. And they take that into account. They also take into account things like um, you know, the importance of, of things for public safety. And so those are the things, it's, it's not a hard and fast criteria and it's not a hard and fast cutoff. Um, there are things that might move in or out of the content uh, outline based upon their expert judgment of this is becoming more important and it's going to be important soon. So we'd better start testing it. Or, you know, this is really trending out and we want to de-emphasize it. Um, or, you know, this is something that isn't all that important, but we know that people are doing it. And, and what we want to make sure is that people are doing it in a safe manner. Um, and then once we have those results, we take it to a policy group. And that's um, made up of people from APTA, um, ACAPT, um, uh, other organizations that um, that are uh, some of our state boards, for example, will will send representatives. And what we want to do is inform them and say, well, these are the changes that are coming in the content outline. What impacts do those have on the profession as a whole? Um, how do we need to communicate this better? Um, are there things that that you think we ought to take up with the exam chairs about uh, perhaps really redefining uh, this, this um, definition a little bit to make it very clear what we're going to ask about? So, um, so we do get feedback from the, the broader stakeholder community. Uh, next slide, please. And over the course of the years, uh, we have been getting qualitative feedback, and that comes in in the post-exam survey. It comes in through our volunteers. It comes in through uh, educators and our educators' workshops and our, our state boards. And uh, we really focused on two pieces of qualitative feedback that we've gotten um, during this round of revisions. One is the desire to show motion. Um, we, we heard this a lot during the last practice analysis um, uh, design process that physical therapy is really about motion and to the extent that we're not representing motion on the exam in a realistic way, it's really um, you know a bit of a pain point for our exam validity, right? So uh, what we wanted to do was take items that we would have otherwise used long wordy descriptions that take a lot of time to read and, and uh, candidates find frustrating to be quite honest and convert those into video format. And so we've been spending the last few years really building up our our, um, uh, our bank of uh, videos uh, under the, the guidance of the exam development committees who said, hey, these are things that we think really need to be represented by a video as opposed to a text description. And so we went out and we, uh, we worked with um, local clinics. Uh, we did some video shoots here. We've also been accepting uh, footage from our, our volunteers, building up that library to better be able to represent things that actually happen in a, in a more realistic uh, clinical setting. The second thing that we heard, and we really heard this uh, during the last uh, set, uh, the last round of standard setting in uh, uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, we heard that uh, patients were becoming more and more medically complex. So you might have someone come in with, um, you know, diabetes or COPD, and they've, you know, they've sustained an injury, and now you've got to have a treatment plan that reflects the complexity of this patient. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a, a more of a straightforward type question. They wanted to be able to represent uh, patients with a longer history, uh, a little bit more information about that. And we uh, took all that information and, and uh, we looked at some of our, our previous assessments and uh, a lot of our volunteers said, hey, maybe we should look at scenario-based questions. So these would be questions that would be independent of one another, but they would all really ask about the same um, patient interaction and give you a standardized set of information about that patient. Um, so that's that's where this came from. And, and those two things are, are moving forward as we speak on the NPTE. Next slide, please. And this slide really covers all that. Um, it goes from 2022 when we had 200 questions and they were uh, 250 questions at the PT level, um, uh, 200 score, 250 total, 50 pretests. At the PTA level, we had 200 questions, 150 scored and 50 pretests. And those were just text and graphics. If we wanted to represent motion, we either had to describe it in words or we had to um, use a graphic with little arrows and things like that. And, and most candidates got that, but occasionally we would get a, a candidate that would reach out to us and say, I, I really had trouble understanding what was going on in this particular uh, question, in this graphic. Um, and that's not something we like to hear. So in uh, 2023, we actually had enough videos 
uh, to start adding them to the NPTE. Um, so we uh, we still had 250 questions at the PT level, uh, 200 questions at the uh, PTA level, same design, 50 pretests, 200 scored, PTA, 150 uh, scored, 50 pretests. Um, but we did include some questions with with uh, videos. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback about that. So that that's great. And now in, in January of 2024, and we've been adding more and more of those um, throughout 2023 um, as we both build up the bank and, and get more and more uh, questions that we feel are, are really good questions and representative of what we want to test. And in 2024, um, we're going to change the, the design of the exam to incorporate scenario questions. So um, we're eliminating about 20, about 10% of the exam content, number of questions at each exam level. We're keeping the time limits the same. Um, and um, uh, we are including scenario-based questions. Now, why are we reducing the number of questions? Well, scenario-based questions are, as we talked about, medi uh, involve medically complex Patients, And what we want to be able to do is allow people enough time to really read through those and understand um, what's going on in this scenario. They do take a little bit longer. Uh, we got some really good advice about this from other testing organizations that use scenario-based questions. And they said you have about a three to five uh, trade-off where you can ask three scenario questions where you would ask about five scenario-based questions. So we reduced the exam length by 10% uh, in terms of number of items kept the time limits the same. And, and that made room on the PT exam for up to 40 scenario-based questions. I don't think we'll see 40 scenario-based questions uh, in the first few years, but ultimately we might have uh, that many questions on, on the PT exam. At the PTA level, um, we'll have up to 35 scenario-based questions on, on any exam form. Next slide, please. Um, how did we figure all this out? Well, we got some good advice. We also did a pilot exam uh, in March and April of 2022. We had about 100 and just under 150 participants uh, that were given a free practice test um, with scenario items and uh, video items. Uh, it was a random sample of registrants. So these were people that were right before they were going to take the NPTE. Um, it included both CAPTI and non-CAPTI candidates. So we wanted to make sure it was a representative group. Um, and the overall results were very positive. Um, I was very pleased with this pilot test. Um, we got really good advice on the design. It, it looked like it was um, right on the way that, that we had, had planned it out. Um, the candidates did spend a little more time on scenario questions as expected. Um, they also spent a little more time on video questions. But the, remember, those video questions are uh, trade-offs. Um, with uh, very otherwise wordy questions. So they spent about the same amount of time on video questions as the questions that they would be replacing. Um, in general, the feedback we got was that candidates thought that the scenario items uh, and video items measured their skills as well or better than standalone multiple choice questions. So 95% of the, the participants uh, said that about video and 98% of them said it about scenario. You, you never see results about this when you change an exam. It was it was unbelievably pleasing to me that that um, we had results this um this positive, and I think it's a it's a testament to the fact that we were listening to people's feedback. This was the feedback that we got, and it turned out to be spot on. Um, and then there was no evidence that candidates ran out of time, so um, uh, so we were really pleased with that. You can go on to the next slide. I, I should probably be hurrying up a little. Um, and also in 2022, as we were doing this, we uh, wanted to make sure that our our fairness guidelines were up to date with the most current standards. And um, and make sure that we were as we develop these new items that our fairness guidelines really represented the the best that we could possibly uh, achieve in terms of, of fairness to candidates of all backgrounds. Um, that included reviewing the professional guidance on this issue. Um, we conducted a volunteer survey. We said, "Hey, you guys are all writing items. What? Where do you feel weak? And how could we help you to to write items that you're more confident are fair?" Um, we updated our training materials, and then we uh, created a, a training video so that people didn't have to read a whole lot of materials. We kind of show them uh, what uh, what was expected in terms of item, uh, writing items and, and reviewing items. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Colleen, who will talk to us about the practice analysis and content outline updates. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, I will talk to you about the updates to the test content outline. 
Uh, so the uh, fundamental structure of the uh, test content outline didn't change significantly. Um, in other words, all of the systems that uh, are there now will stay the same in 2024, and all of the professional work activities, such as PT examination, interventions, those all will stay the same. Uh, the majority of the recommended changes are quantitative changes, where some areas will carry slightly more weight than they do now, and others will carry slightly less weight. So just a 30,000 um, foot perspective first, big picture, the PT task force that Lauren just mentioned came in and they recommended uh, relative increases in the percentage of items testing knowledge in the neuromuscular and nervous system and the cardiovascular and pulmonary system. Um, the PT task force recommended a relative increase in uh, questions within the neuromuscular and nervous system testing knowledge about PT examination, so tests and measures, with a relative decrease in neuromuscular and nervous interventions, and I'll speak a little bit to that. They also recommended uh, relative decreases uh, in items related to therapeutic modalities and to the metabolic and endocrine systems. So I'll show you what that looks like now. So this slide will show you the 2018 test content outline on the left. Uh, with a total of 200 scored items per form. And the test content outline that will be in effect beginning January 2024 uh, for, uh, with a total of 180 scored items on each form. Um, we use the numerical ranges. You see the numerical ranges here. Uh, and those ranges allow us to build in flexibility if we have to make last minute item replacements on a form. Doesn't happen too often, but sometimes it does. And we like to have that flexibility. Um, these ranges also allow us to reduce the number of times that we expose items on forms, um, which lends itself to test, test security. So when I talk about relative increases or relative decreases to the, to the content on the test content outline, we have to take into consideration, one, that there are going to be 10% less items on each form, and number two, that the ranges might impact those relative changes, which might not appear very pronounced. So as I stated in the last slide, uh, there's going to be a little bit uh, more relative emphasis and a subsequent increase in the percentage of items testing knowledge, most notably in the cardiovascular and pulmonary system. Um, uh, the, the PT Practice Analysis Task Force uh, discussed um, why, and they said that basically it's, it's really important to consideration that, consider that the implications and complications of COVID um, are going to be trending up in our society. Uh, they also looked at that um, aggregate data from 2018 all the way to 2022, as Lauren mentioned, and that aggregate data demonstrated that the survey respondents rated items related to the cardiovascular and pulmonary system with a high level of mean importance. So that lent to their their recommendation. There, there will also be an increase in the percentage of items uh, testing knowledge within the neuromuscular and nervous system, similar to what the task force panel did in 2016. The panelists last year voted to keep items testing knowledge related to peripheral nerve dysfunction within the neuromuscular and nervous system, so it made sense to them to keep the relative percentage of items in this, in this system high. Um, they also felt that there is a higher volume of textbooks to support item writers in writing items about PT examination, so tests and measures of the neuromuscular and nervous system. So you'll see that that uh, will move from 15 to 17 as it is now to 13 to 16 in January 2024. Um, alternatively, some neuromuscular and nervous system interventions, such as NDT, BOBATH, um, have been falling out of practice as there's been an increasing push for more evidence-based practice in our profession. And so we'll see that reflected in the move from uh, 15 to 17 to 13 to 16. As I mentioned, the panel also suggested a decrease in the percentage of items uh, testing knowledge within therapeutic modalities. The discussion in the PT task force was that current entry-level PT practice really focuses or should focus on active and not passive interventions. And the data also suggests that some knowledge and skill requirements are trending down in mean importance. So they suggested uh, omitting one knowledge and skill uh, 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 related to phonophoresis, and that contributed to their to their decision. So we'll see um, 
that will go from six to eight as it is now to four to six in January, 2024. The metabolic and endocrine system uh, will also decrease. And similar to dis the discussion during the 2016 task force meeting, the, the, the task force meeting last year said, it's not really feasible to write items um, on PT examination of the metabolic and, and endocrine system because PT primarily perform screenings of the system rather than direct examination of the system. And additionally, tests of this body system are primarily conducted in the lab and not by a practicing PT. Uh, they also wanted to keep osteoporosis within metabolic and endocrine, and so all that weighed into their recommendation. Switching gears, the PTA task force recommended um, relative increases in these four categories. So the non-system safety and protection, the neuromuscular and nervous system, equipment devices and technologies, and cardiovascular and pulmonary system with a relative decrease in therapeutic modalities and the integumentary system. Again, a side-by-side -side comparison, 2018 is on your left and uh, 2024 is on your right with the um, numerical ranges uh, highlighted in red. Um, you see 150 items per form um, uh, for 2018 and moving to 140 in January, 2024. Um, and so I'll just speak a little bit to why the PTA task force recommended a relative increase in items, testing knowledge, most notably in safety and protection. That was uh, number one. Why? Um, the implications and widespread consequences of COVID, they felt, has made infection control a critical topic for safety and public protection. So uh, that will move up. This was followed by the neuromuscular and nervous system. The PTA panel acknowledged that um, items within this system are very, you know, very much integrated within the muscular skeletal system. There's a lot. There's a wide breadth of content to cover that an item writer could cover when writing uh, unique content to the system. And you don't necessarily have to have a significant neurological deficit to benefit from neurological interventions. So they wanted to keep that, uh, that high. Um, number three, equipment, devices, and technologies that will move from seven to nine to eight to 10. Uh, they said that the content domain within um, this system or this non-system is common for PTAs in all practice settings, whether you're in acute, subacute, home health, um, you need to be able to, um, to uh, use equipment devices and technologies and perform them to be a safe and effective entry-level practitioner. And lastly, the cardiovascular and pulmonary system. The, the task force panelists said that the risk is high if the entry-level PTA is not able to recognize and appropriately respond to signs and symptoms of cardiovascular and pulmonary compromise. The PTA panel, similar to the PT panel, recommended a little less relative emphasis, primarily in therapeutic modalities. We'll see that will go from you know, nine to 11 to five to seven. Um, why was this? They looked at the aggregate data, which showed consistently low rating, ratings and mean importance. There was a lot of robust discussion amongst this task force panel that some modalities just aren't widely available and therefore don't really represent what an entry-level PTA practitioner needs to be able to perform to be safe and effective. So examples would be phonophoresis or iontophoresis. And lastly, the integumentary system uh, will go down a little bit. Uh, there were a lot of inf interventions within this system that were considered above entry level, such as non-selective debridement or application of wound care dressings, and those work activities were omitted, so that reflected their suggestion to decrease the emphasis within that system. So I'll come down to uh, a 10,000 foot perspective and um, get into the weeds a little bit, provide a little bit more detail. Um, the PT knowledge and skill requirements, as Lauren said, when we say knowledge and skill requirements, it, that's basically just a broad description of the knowledge that an entry level practitioner needs to be able to know in order to be safe and effective. So the uh, PT panel suggested uh, that, that they add the impact of regenerative medicine um, on physical therapy prognosis and interventions related to both the musculoskeletal system and the neuromuscular and nervous system. Um, back in 2016, during the last practice analysis, that task force believed that uh, 
this KSR might be too specialized and not entry level. However, last year, the task force unanimously voted uh, that this is becoming much more commonplace and important for public protection. And um, they also uh, suggested to add the provision of telehealth. The task force felt that this was relevant for patient communication and treatment, uh, creating and maintaining access to specialists in some areas of the country. So in January 2024, a PT candidate um, might have to answer a question related to regenerative medicine and or the appropriateness uh, or efficacy of telehealth uh, treatment for a given patient. Um, the therapeutic modalities, so the knowledge behind how to apply the indications, the contraindications and precautions of phonophoresis were dropped off the test content outline for PT. The panelists looked at the survey response data, which suggested that the related work activity was trending down in practice and showing low mean importance. And the panelists felt um, it's really just not being universally used in the majority of work settings. So they suggested both, uh, omitting both the KSR, the knowledge and skill requirement and the work activity. Um, so again, work activities are those activities on the job that an entry level practitioner needs to be able to do. And I wanted to start with the work activities that will be dropped off um, off the test content outline. Um, the uh, applying taping for lymphatic drainage was removed and it was really replaced with taping for edema management. Uh, the task force felt that the term lymphatic drainage is too specific, which may have resulted in um, mean importance uh, falling down over the years. Um, and so then they, so they, they switched those out. They also, as I said in the last slide, um, performing phonophoresis was removed because the task force felt that it's just not reflective of current entry-level practice. So um, taping for lymphatic drainage and phonophoresis are going to be considered uh, work activities deemed not critical. Um, and I'll show you how to find that information in a little bit. The work activities that were added, again, taping for edema management, also interpretation of electrodiagnostic test results like EMG or, or NCV, uh, there was a, a real healthy discussion about the difference between understanding summary results, which they felt was definitely entry level for the PT, versus interpreting raw data, which they felt was above entry level. So understanding the results is important to effective practice, and that's why that was added. Also, the act of performing or training the patient or client in gross motor development progression was added. This was a work activity that was added to the survey back in 2019 and officially added as a critical work activity in 2024. They felt that this work activity should be expected of entry-level PTs who are providing care across the lifespan. And this, they felt like this was important for providing a basis for assessment, intervention and treatment progression. And then the last work activity that was added was um, applying negative pressure wound therapy, um, also known as wound vax. There was a lot of back and forth discussion amongst the, the task force about this particular work activity. Uh, but they did uh, collectively agree that um, although this uh, specific modality was is very dependent on the work setting. The majority of the, the panelists felt that this addition is necessary because wound vacs um, are entry level and they're oftentimes the preferred treatment. They felt that this was important for the entry level practitioner to be able to understand how to use it and how to train others to use it. There were no PTA KSRs that were uh, officially added to the test content outline. Um, however, there was some debate about the addition of telehealth. Um, however, the majority of the task force, the PTA task force, did not think it was an it was appropriate to test in this particular area because the provision is largely job specific and there aren't a lot of you know large volume of good reference materials to support item writers writing to this content. Um, does this mean that we're going to stop monitoring this? Um, no, it's absolutely on the uh, practice analysis survey. We're going to continue to monitor it. Um, and we added a note in the test content outline matrix um, just to basically say that it could be 
um, embedded into the context of a treatment. So you could, for example, see an item on a PTA form in which the, the context of the treatment was telehealth, but the PTA candidate would not have to know the specifics of telehealth uh, to be able to answer it correctly. The PTA KSR that was dropped, there were two of them. That was the impact of pharmacology used to treat the GI system on physical therapy management. Um, why was this dropped? Um, the task force felt that this might have limited applicability, um, be too specialized and really not have a significant impact on safety. So they made the recommendation to drop that. And then lastly, like the PT task force, the PTA task force omitted um, phonophoresis. Uh, they said, you know, they, they dropped the work activity because the task force felt it's not reflective of current PTA practice. They also said it's really hard to justify why PTAs should be held accountable for needing to know the information about applications, indications of phonophoresis when PT panelists argued it should be dropped because it wasn't current PT practice. So that was the discussion there. And then um, the PTA work activities that were added was the um, performing or training a patient or client in gross motor development progression. This moved up in mean importance. And so this will be a critical work activity for the PTA in 2024. And then the majority of the work activities that were removed, you see many of them here, all of them are, are actually here. And the majority of, of the work activities that were removed were removed because they were deemed above entry level for the PTA or they required specialized training. Um, so we think about mechanical repositioning for vestibular dysfunction um, or taping for neuromuscular reeducation. Um, there were many that were also um, just deemed to not be widely available, as I've said before, and not representative of current entry-level PTA practice. This was the case with iontophoresis and phonophoresis. And then lastly, the participation in professional organizations was deemed not relevant to safe and effective practice. Lauren? Thank you, Colleen. Uh, that was very informative. The um... The next thing we'd like to talk about are the PT and uh, PTA and PT standard review task forces that met over the summer to review the passing uh, standards for the NPTE. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the task forces, the PTA task force met uh, June 2nd through 4th and the PT task force met July 7th through 9th of uh, 2023. And you'll notice we, we use the term standard review, and that is consistent with what's in our, our policy manual that we will review the passing standard. Um, in the past, we conducted what were known as standard settings, and I think um, that really led us to um, do things, what I consider maybe a little bit backwards, that we would start with a um, the content and have the task forces then uh, estimate a standard, and then we tell them what the standard currently is and how different their their estimate was from the standard. So what we wanted to do this time was use a more innovative uh, approach that that's more in line with contemporary uh, standard setting methods. And uh, we actually have uh, the our facilitator is the person who wrote the book on standard setting. So we could not get a better facilitator for this. Um, we went with a approach we're calling the historical bookmark method. And we actually uh, were being encouraged to publish this. Um, it's it's a little bit more intuitive. It uh, what it does is it takes a test form and it orders it from the easiest question on the test to the hardest question on the test, and then it shows you about where the standard uh, is in terms of uh, the content. Where fifty percent of that uh, person who just barely passes the test uh, would would get that question right. So fifty percent of the people that get a six hundred, for example, would be expected to get a particular question right. Um, and then we set up boundaries around that and said, and if you if you uh, decide to change the standard to this question uh, and and say 50% of the just qualified people should get this question right, um, that would result in a passing standard that was as high as we've had it in the last 10 years. Um, if you set it a little bit further in the book, 
then this would result in a much lower pass rate than we've had in the past 10 years. So we really wanted to kind of ground them in that um, idea that it's it's both content, it's got to be related back to the practice analysis and the changes that we saw in the practice analysis, which, as Colleen showed, were, were not really major uh, uh, changes. They were more fine-tuning. Um, and we want to be do this in a way that's sensitive to to pass rates, which, um, and I think you'll understand the reason why as as um, we go through this presentation. Um, so there's much more information up front, um, and what we found were that the panelists really did uh, uh, like this process better. It was a lot more intuitive, uh, got to their answer a lot more quickly. Um, there wasn't as much kind of hand wringing about. Uh, the impact of the standard and so forth. Um, the results, the recommendations were very minor adjustments to the cut scores. And um, we believe they're likely gonna be relatively inconsequential to pass rates. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Colleen. Thanks. Uh, so I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the, the discussions uh, during the, the standard review uh, task force meetings. Um, during both the PT and PTA task force meetings, the discussion uh, with both sets of panelists really focused on the very minor changes to the task content outline. Uh, they also focused on the evolution of PT and PTA training and the changes in expectations for entry-level practitioners since the last standard was set back in 2016. 17. Uh, many of the panelists stated that their students were routinely um, exposed to scenarios and video-based items in the classroom, and they didn't uh, really feel that this change in item format would pose a significant barrier to their students. Um, Another uh, reason why they recommended the cut score not change too much was because they felt that the entry-level PT and PTA need to maintain a deep and broad knowledge base in order to manage and care for patients in a healthcare landscape following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so the discussion was very rich, and although both sets of panelists uh, as Lauren said, did not recommend any really big changes to the cut score. They did identify some areas of change and emerging trends. Um, so for the PT group, uh, quickly, the, the discussion really focused on two main themes. Uh, they collectively agreed that the entry-level PT students are likely to face ongoing and possible long-term challenges mastering curricular content due to the impact of COVID-19. And number two, uh, the ethical and knowledge-based expectations for the entry-level DPT as a primary health care provider and a point of access provider when treating patients in increasingly popular settings like cash-based private pay or solo practice. Uh, for the PTA task force, the discussion really focused on the uh, decreased PT supervision of the entry-level PTA because in some states, the time frame for a PT reassessment by the supervising PT may be extended from 30 days to 60 days. And then lastly, the current patient population, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there was also some discussion that uh, patients in the COVID, post-COVID uh, pandemic may be receiving relatively less education from other healthcare professionals, so the entry-level PTA would need to maintain a broad understanding of entry-level knowledge to provide comprehensive education to the patient. Okay, and so we mentioned uh, that that uh, we uh, considered pass rates uh, during this process, and we really gave them this information up front. Um, we wanted to do that, make it make it a little bit more upfront uh, with them about pass rates because there was this precipitous drop in pass rates um, uh, following the pandemic lock lockdown in 2020. Uh, we had a lot of people come through and, and pass at a high rate, but that that fell uh, quite a bit in 2021 and continue to fall in 2022. Um, it has leveled off a bit in 2023, and we really don't expect the new standard uh, to impact pass rates in 2024. We're expecting a tiny bit of a rebound, uh, but again, that's that's really anybody's guess. Um, this is these are the pass rates for for PTA, so we expect they should be about the same. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are for PT. I'm sorry. Um, and for PTA, uh, we're really expecting uh, about the same. Uh, we did see a similar drop off uh, in 2021 and, and 2022. That rebounded a little bit in 2023. And, and again, in 2024, we don't expect that pass rates will be changed unless we see um, really a content or, or um, curriculum based rebound uh, in 2024 that um, uh, 
candidates are 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 now uh, better prepared for the uh, for the exam. Again, we don't we don't. This isn't a function of the exam, um, as many of you educators know. I think everyone is struggling out there to to uh, teach content uh, effectively, both during the uh, uh, the lockdown uh, and um, uh, using virtual. Uh, um, virtual delivery and, and so forth. So um, this, this again, isn't, isn't really a function of the exam. We don't expect that the standard, uh, the new standard will have much of an impact at all. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about Pete and I want to let everybody know that the uh, practice exams were updated in October. Uh, so we sent out emails to uh, current users, letting them know uh, when the new content would be available. Uh, these are revised forms, not brand new forms. Um, so what we did is we took existing forms, we, we took out any content that was outdated, we added some new questions in um, uh, to, to uh, reflect new content, uh, added the scenario items. And so, so what we're advising people is that if you took, if you're planning to take the MPT in January and you've taken the PEAT, um, you know, in September or so, and, and you thought about taking the NPT in October, you're not going to have to buy Pete again. It, it's probably not going to be uh, much of benefit to you. Um, there are additional forms. If you've only taken it once, there, there are additional forms. Or if you've taken academic Pete, we have two sets of additional forms for individual Pete. So they can still buy it again, but there, there shouldn't be any need because their score should be very, very much predictive of uh, their performance on the NPTE as uh, Pete has been for many years. So again, no need to retake it. We do recommend that people look at the demo exam. If you look at the uh, questions answered uh, in the chat um, there in the, or in the Q&A, uh, I do have a link to the demo exam there. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Lauren. And you just uh, set me up for uh, uh, showing the demo exam. Um, the question is, what will the new items look like in 2024? I'm sure uh, that's the $64,000 question for at least for the scenario items. Um, and so if you haven't uh, been to our website, we highly recommend that you um, type in demo exam. Um, not only will this uh, show you the look and feel of what candidates are going to see when they uh go into the Prometric Testing Center, but it will also show you some examples of video and scenario items. Um, and so what I was gonna do is see if I could get this to play. And so this is what our website looks like. Hopefully, can you guys see this? Yes, yes. okay. And uh, we'll start the demo exam here. And the candidate will have to read the security agreement, accept those terms. And uh, it will walk you through a tutorial. Um, so I just wanted to point out um, a couple things about navigating through the exam, specifically when it comes to uh, video questions. Um, there are a lot of questions from um, stakeholders about uh, will their students be able to play uh, video more than one time? They absolutely will. And this will walk you through. All they need to do is to click the loop button to activate uh, continuous looping for the videos that they see. Um, it suggested that you click the looping button before playing the video. Um, and so they won't have to press that more than once. Um, they will be able to play videos in slow motion. Um, uh, all they need to do is hover over the speed, and I'll show that to you, but they can go at 25, 50, 75, or at, um, at regular speed. Um, and so I just wanted to start the test here and show you number 12. Um, this is our uh, one of our sample video items. We're going to toggle the loop and then press play, and it will play continuously as I read the stem of the question here. Um, and which is the exercise in the video would be most appropriate for a patient who has which of the following gate deviations. And you think about all the words that we um, were able to omit, um, you know, uh, standing, dynamic, uh, bilateral hip abduction using a resistive tubing, right? So the candidate actually has to analyze the movement, um, make the judgment call without all of those words, and then choose uh, the best choice here. Um, and so I wanted to show you one more. We're going to finish this section and move on to the other section. This is another example of a video question that we have. Again, I'm going to toggle here and then press play, and I can play um, 
disk here at 75% different speeds, as I said, or pause it. Um, I did want to speak to um, the background here. We have guidelines um, for our volunteers who shoot video and guidelines when we shoot videos. We really do, um, this is not representative of a, a typical video. Um, it is just part of the demo exam, but we really do try to ensure that um, there are very minimal distractions and that the um, candidate's eye is drawn to only what we want their, their eyes to see and that it's clearly um, Vi you know, able to be visualized by everybody. Um, at this also includes de-identifying um, our subject models in the event that it's not necessary to see their eyes or their nose. We try to de-identify um, all of our uh, patient models to the best of our ability. And there is no audio for any videos. We get that question a lot. Most of our videos, we try to ensure that it's uh, around 12 seconds or less. But here's an example um, of the STEM, the video, and then the options as well. Um, wanted just to take you to the last uh, section here um, of the demo exam and show you what a scenario will look like. Um, so we see um, the standard subheadings that that uh, will be um, in most of our scenarios, um, including the setting, the sex, the age, presenting problem or current relevant uh, condition, uh, relevant medical history, other information, um, physical therapy examination, tests and measures, and then the physical therapy plan of care. Those will be, uh, for the most part, standardized subheadings for each scenario. And then uh, the candidate will be able to see uh, the, uh, it, the item. Again, as Lauren said, these scenario-based items are independent of one another, um, so we don't want um, to allow hinging um, or double jeopardy. Um, and so, um, this is just how it will look. So the candidate will be able to see the scenario um, statically on the left-hand side of the screen and then uh, scroll through um, the relevant scenario-based items within that scenario. So just wanted to show that to you um, as an example. Uh, please do use the demo exam. Uh, and then um, just wanted to show a couple sample scenario items outside of the demo exam. Um, as I said, um, all of these items, all of the scenario-based items are going to be independent of one another. Uh, this is just an example of, a, uh, of an item testing knowledge in the cardiovascular and pulmonary um, examination. Um, and so uh, we see an individual 65 years old with Parkinson disease. Um, we see his relevant medications. Um, and the question is, uh, to, you know, which of the following measures are the most appropriate to target um, aerobic exercise intensity. And so we would want that well-prepared candidate to think to themselves, okay, this patient has Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, uh, often have, uh, individuals often have autonomic dysfunction, which blunts the cardiovascular and pulmonary response to exercise. So I'm thinking about a modified Borg scale and which one between three and four. Um, and, um, Ideally, the best prepared candidate um, would um, know that patients with Parkinson's disease benefit from high intensity aerobic training to promote neuroplasticity. And so the key is number four. So that's sort of how we, um, those are the pieces of information that we would want the well-prepared candidate to have to synthesize to be able to answer these questions. Again, for this one, um, in terms of medications, um, what point in time would be ideal um, for taking the medications. Uh, we would want that well-prepared candidate to look and see they're on levodopa um, and to know that motor performance is usually best for patients 20 to 60 minutes following use of this medication um, and therapy may, might have the, the most benefit for patients during this window of time. And so that's um, just an example of um, how we want uh, candidates to thread information from the scenario to answer the question. This is the last one. Um, uh, assistive devices uh, to be most appropriate for patients when walking outside. Uh, we would want them to be able to look at the timed up and go um, 
uh, uh, test time, which which suggests a high fall risk for this individual, and to know that outdoor ambulation presents a greater challenge, um, and so the patient would most likely benefit from greater stability and use a device that can limit dual tasking because of their uh, their diagnosis, um, and so the front wheeled walker uh, is is the key. It's like likely to to um, to be the safest device that promotes mobility uh, within this patient. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times we get the question of, hey, where can I find all this information better? Um, I recommend you just Google NPTE validity. Um, uh, you should be able to find a, a page called ensuring validity and NPT content. And that will give you the practice analysis results, the list of critical work activities, a list of work activities deemed not critical. So you can uh, check those off your list. Um, it also provides links to previous reports um, and it has a link to previous uh, frequently asked questions on upcoming changes to the NPTE. So all that, all that stuff is online. We don't want anybody to be guessing about what is or isn't covered by the NPTE or what is or isn't fair game. Next slide, please. This is where uh, I get into shameless self-promotion. Um, we do have uh, also workshops for educators. Um, we get a lot of good feedback about these. We do have kind of limited slots, um, but we are opening registration for in-person February 13th and 14th workshop in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, that will be immediately preceding APTA CSM. So we're trying to uh, coordinate our workshops uh, with them to make travel for educators um, a little bit more convenient. And then we'll have a uh, virtual workshop uh, at some point next year. We haven't quite decided on the, the time frame, but we'll um, once uh, registration closes for the February workshop, uh, we'll start communicating about the virtual workshop. And again, you can just Google MPT workshop for educators, and that should take you straight to our page. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the questions we got in the chat was, uh, when will this be out? Will it be out in July? No, it will be out in, in January. So this is, uh, this is it. Uh, we are transitioning all the exams to this new design as of January 2024. So uh, make sure that, that your students are prepared if they're testing in January, April. Next slide. Uh, we want to open it up for uh, a quick round of questions. I think uh, we do have a little bit of... Uh, um, a couple things to cover before we end, uh, but I'll hand it over to Ellen. So lots of activity, excuse me, so lots of activity on the uh, Q&A as well as the chat. You should be able to see the Q&A uh, <clears throat> questions as well as the answers that Lauren has been so quickly typing in. Uh, just reiterate a couple things. Um, Pete, tell us when it's going to be updated and how it's going to reflect the new content. So it has already been updated. Uh, if you buy Pete today or you start Pete today, even if you bought it uh, a year ago and you just start it today, uh, it will reflect the new content. As well as the video and scenario-based items? Absolutely. Uh, Colleen's been, been working her fingers to the bone on this. Uh, another big theme was the uh, independence of the items on the scenario-based questions. Can you reiterate that, please? That's a great question. Uh, so in a, a lot of times in a scenario-based question, the uh, questions will build upon one another. And the, the downside, the nice side, uh, thing, uh, the nice side to that is that you do get questions that kind of build upon one another and you can test things sequentially. The downside to that is if you miss one, then you're predisposed to miss every other question in the scenario. Ours don't work that way. They're really independent. Um, so we provide a lot of information. And then we ask questions that are really um, independent questions. That doesn't mean that people aren't more likely to get two of them right or or uh, two of them wrong at the same time, but it just means that um, it's not kind of me mechanically in there that they will definitely get the second one wrong if they've, if they've answered the first one wrong. Great, thank you. Uh, just reiterate again where people can find the demo exam. There's lots and lots of questions on the demo exam as well as will people be able to, I know Colleen talked about being able to slow it down and loop it. Is there, there was a question about um, <clears throat> full screen of the video piece of it. Yeah, as I uh, understand it, they will be able to, to enlarge the videos, um, but my best advice is to really go to that demo exam, just Google MPTE demo exam, but we've got the links uh, here uh, in the chat if you, if you look for them. Uh, Google MPTE demo exam or Google MPTE PEAT uh, practice exam. 
Um, either one of those, I think, will be good practice for your students. Um, and and really, uh, the demo exam will show you exactly how videos work. Pete, Pete videos work a little differently because it's not it's not Prometric software; it's our software. Uh, mm -hmm. But they're very similar, and it will give you adequate practice. And I think most most candidates will be fine with that. We do recommend that people go to the demo exam at least to run through those items and just see how things work, so that um, they don't get thrown for a loop uh, when they're in the test center. Great, thank you. Uh, just test administration, uh, what has, just reiterate, what has changed when it comes to the scheduled breaks as well as the sections, just both PT and PTA, just reiterate where they either can find that or what the answer is to that question. Yeah, I, that's probably a little out of my wheelhouse. The I think the breaks and everything work basically the same way. There's an extended break after the second section for PT, um, which is halfway through for PTA. And um, uh, but again, you can find all that information in the candidate handbook. Um, if you Google NPTE design or NPTE administration uh, within our our uh, web page, you should be able to find that information. Okay, uh, let's see. Who deals with scheduling of seats? A totally different question. What part of the FSPPT answers questions about scheduling of seats? In the yeah, that's our sentence? exam. That's our exam services department. I um, uh, if if there are kind of a broad systemic issues with um, folks at at uh, your institution. Um, uh, they can often work with Prometric to make sure that the appropriate number of seats are being reserved on our test date. So uh, if you have an issue with that, I'd, I'd reach out to exam services at fsppt.org and, and just let them know. And, and in general, they are um, able to, to um, uh, work with Prometric and just ensure that, that we do have adequate uh, coverage there. Uh, I did get a note that if, if people Google MPT demo exam, sometimes you'll get a longer list of, of um, uh, ads uh, up front. So just make sure you get to our website uh, yeah. when, you're, when you yeah. Google Pete or the, the demo exam. Not that those yeah. aren't good people. <laughs> no, but that's a great that's a great clarification is making sure you're at uh, fsbpt.org. Yeah. Um, there was actually a question, if the students need to retake the NPTE from 2023, will they retake using the new 2024 format? Yes. Right. <laughs> good answer. All right, uh, one more question. There were some questions, and this can only be answered to some degree, I'm sure, but about, you know, getting out your crystal ball, about the pass rates and, you know, what the pass score is and, and all that kind of stuff. If you can just give a, maybe a bigger picture answer to that, that would be great. Yeah, pass rates are always a projection. And so what we do is we look at the last few years of data and then we kind of say, well, assuming the same people came through, this is what we'd expect the pass rate to be. Um, now that's always a projection because the same people aren't coming through. They're gonna be different people. We hope that they're comparable in many cases, um, but you know, the world has changed a lot in the past few years and, and we can't project quite as, as certainly as we could in the past. Pass rates have always gone up and down a little bit due to factors outside of all of our control, but we don't expect the new standard to change pass rates uh, at all. I mean, we expect uh, them to be, uh, you know, within kind of rounding error, within about a half a percentage point. Um, they weren't really changes. They were just minor adjustments. Um, and, and so, again, I wouldn't uh, expect pass rates to change at all unless, um, you know, things are, are different in terms of the people that are coming through. And everybody, have I post something if I've missed any major area that uh, that you've asked about. Ooh, here we go. Hang on. Um, oh, so it's a question about the, um, the time period. I think you really talked about this when you talked about the number of items for the exam now, but basically what research was done looking at average time to look at how people answer scenario-based questions um, and then the ones with the video. Yeah, so we got some guidance from other uh, testing organizations and kind of the medical licensure uh, realm that uh, suggested that generally about, you could ask about three uh, questions uh, in a scenario format that that uh, would equal about five questions in a standalone format. And so we used that, we did a, a pilot study and we found that to be very accurate. Now, as we go forward, we will have information about how much time people spend on actual test questions. 
um, and and we'll be able to build that in. Uh, but but in general, I think we're we're very comfortable that um, the the current design isn't going to lead people to run out of time on the exam. In general, the NPT is not a speeded exam. That doesn't mean that people don't you know, feel some time pressure or some of them actually run out of time, but we don't see evidence that the timing affects their score. And I, th I think somebody asked if the passing score will be 600. It will always be 600. We, uh, we have some psychometric magic that, that keeps it that way. So um, it will always be 600. That's right, that's right. I don't see any new questions. And uh, we are right at the end of our time. So I will just, I'm just peeking one more time. Um, thank you for all your fantastic questions. Great questions. It was interesting. Everyone's kind of, you know, tying into some of the same things. I think as we all look more at the the practice practice exams and the, uh, uh, the samples, that will be a big help to all of us who educate these students. Um, I do want to just highlight December's regulatory hour. With um, We have one coming up now with on December. It's cut off on my screen. I'm sorry, December 13th, I think it is. Um, and it's for actually new board members and staff. And I, when I thought about this, yes, if you're new to your board, your state board, this would be the uh, session for you, give you some highlight things to think about, as well as if you're, uh, you, there's a lot of educators on this call and you know, a lot of boards are looking for really good board members. So maybe this would be a good uh, seminar for you to, to join just to hear about really the doings of being sitting on a state board. I highly recommend it. So with that, I want to thank Lauren and Colleen for their expertise and amazing amount of information. Uh, this will be available in the near future on the event portal uh, under, under this uh, presentation. And if you need to get in touch with, if you can maybe go back to your individual emails again, and just uh, if you have very specific questions, these are your experts when it comes to content as well as the format of the exam. And I want to thank you and thanks for everyone for joining us today and we'll see you soon.